Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dave Bittler. I'm the pastor here at St. John Hill Church. Welcome. If you're visiting with us, we extend a special welcome to you this morning. Um, the only announcement I have is one that I'm very happy and relieved to give. Uh, with this past Wednesday, we successfully closed on our house in North Carolina. Uh, so that was a huge, a huge blessing and answer to prayer. I uh, just got a couple of final utility bills to take care of and <laughs> be able to, to not have to worry about that uh, anymore. But that's a great thing. I appreciate your prayers uh, for us along that road. Uh, are there other announcements that we can make for the good of the group this morning? Yes, sir. First, we have a quick meeting of the park committee and anyone that's interested in helping with the hand shuffle that's coming up in May or at your church in the primary room. All right. So the park committee meeting and anyone wanting to help with the hand supper in yeah. May, uh, they're going to meet in the primary room after church uh, this morning. Yes. I talked to Tom Jordan over. Um, he said he's doing wonderful after his knee replacement, and he said, you know us young whippersnappers, you can't keep us down. I said, well, that's good. I said, are you taking care of Shirley, keeping her in line, or is she keeping you in line? And then he got quiet, and I didn't know if he heard me. I said, are you keeping Shirley in line, or is she keeping you in line? He said, I heard Jim. He said, she doesn't keep me in line. I said, okay, that's good. <laughs> so he's doing wonderful. Any others? Okay. I didn't know if you see that Levi had come home. Yes. Uh, he's doing good. So. Yeah, he's he's growing like a little chunk here, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would praise God that uh, baby Levi is home and doing quite well. And uh, mom and dad doing pretty good too. Yeah. All right. And they're Yes, they do. <laughs> Any others? Let's take a few moments and prepare our hearts for worship. morning comes from Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. 
O you who hear prayer, to you shall come all flesh. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. The one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. This time we'll hear from our choir. treasures of heaven, 
our neglect of your wise and gracious law. Help us to change our way of life so that we may desire what is good, love what you love, and do what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's take a few moments and confess our own sins to God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for our sins, who rose again from the dead. We come before you to plead the mercy of his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, would you hear the prayers of our hearts? and forgive us. Give us your spirit to make us more like Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. The prophet Isaiah prophesied of the Messiah, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. We believe that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who was crushed for our sins, even today in heaven, makes intercession for us before the Father for the forgiveness of our sins. Let us sing of our truly awesome Reading and hearing of his word. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we come before your word this morning in submission to your wisdom and knowledge, your goodness and truth. May you stir in us the good news of Jesus Christ. Would you help us to hear and obey your word? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So far we have seen that God has made a world, formed it and fashioned it for his purpose, the purpose of create the creation of mankind to be his covenant partner in ruling and having dominion over this world in a good and moral sense. We've seen that God created mankind, male and female, to work together in covenant relationship with each other and with him to fill the earth and subdue it, to extend the borders of the Garden of Eden to all the world where God's image would be throughout the whole world. That the whole world would know that the King, God himself, reigns, not just where he planted them, but everywhere that they were to go. And we read at the end of chapter 1, in verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. But interestingly enough, the author of Genesis, I believe was Moses, doesn't stop at the creation of mankind. It was good. It was even very good that God created man. But it wasn't the end. It was very important that the writer tells us about the seventh day. And there's a lot of interesting things that we see about the seventh day. And it would be very easy just to read over these verses and be like, Okay, well, God created the world in six days, and then he took a break. Right? There's a little more to it than that. And thanks be to God, for us, there's a lot more to this than originally meets the eye. One of the things that we have to understand is that in Hebrew writing, numbers are generally, not always, but generally very significant. If you've grown up in the church and you've you know, followed the stories, you notice that certain numbers appear quite often. So we know that you know, there were 12 tribes of Israel. There were also 12 disciples, 12 apostles. That wasn't just coincidence. There were 40 Days that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. There were 40 years that the people of Israel wandered in the wilderness. 40, 12, 7 are all very important numbers in Hebrew numerology. 7 is a number that represents Completeness, it represents perfection. And so logic would have it that the number six is one short. It's one less than complete. It's one less than perfection. Seven is God's number, as it were. His number of because it wasn't on the sixth day that he sanctified it and made it holy. It was on the seventh day. God makes a very special 
determination, thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So he, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. God blesses this seventh day, this Sabbath day of rest. Now, what did God actually rest from? Many people have believed over the years in, in what we generally refer to as deism, where God would be the great clockmaker, right? And for six days, he formed the clock and he wound the clock and he got it all running. And then on the seventh day, he took his hands off it and he said he's just going to let it run until it runs out and he's not going to be involved with it anymore. Um, that's not... Bible tells us. That God created the world. He was very active in creating it. And then on the seventh day, he rested, but he didn't stop working. Because we believe that God not only created the world, but he also actively sustains it. That's good news for you and me. Because that means that we are not just left to our own devices. We are not just left on our own to try to figure out how to make our way through this life without any help from God himself. God's not just sitting back going, hmm, I wonder how this one's going to turn out. No. God sustains what he makes. What he made on the first day, he sustains into the second day. What he what he makes on the second day, he sustains into the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. God keeps his hands, his energy, his power throughout creation. But on the seventh day, he rests from the active work of creation. But he does not rest from his work of providence to keep the creation going. There's something very interesting to see in the, the account of the seventh day. In the first six days, they all end with the same refrain. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day, the second day, the third day, all the way up through the sixth day. In the seventh day, you didn't hear that, did you? You didn't miss it. It's just not there. God, in his timing, is still on the seventh day. He's resting from his work, but he's still actively working in holding everything together. He's still active in making sure that everything is happening according to his will. He is still actively pursuing his mission of having his image across the face of the earth. And in fact, we see this in the New Testament. Jesus himself has said when he proclaims himself to be Lord over the Sabbath, he says, my father has been working from creation until now. He's active in the world. He didn't just wind it up and let it go and say, well, I hope everything turns out okay. We have the assurance of knowing that we serve a God who is active in our day-to-day -day life and activities. He cares about what we do when we get up in the morning. He cares about his mission. He cares about our part in his mission throughout the world. But what he does in creation is he gives us a pattern, and we see this in the Ten Commandments, in the Fourth Commandment that we read from Exodus chapter 20. That God set up a pattern for us to follow. God works for six days, and he rests from his creative work on the seventh. We live in a culture that has kind of forgotten that. 
It's kind of looked over the importance of rest. Work all you can. Earn all you can. Take every opportunity to do what you can. Working seven days a week. As much as you can because we've got to have more. We've always got to have as much as we can. Now, some of you who are in farming, we understand Especially if you've got dairy cows. It doesn't matter what, they don't take the Sabbath off. You know, they don't know that you're supposed to rest that day when it's time for them to be built. you got to get in there and do it. They're not going to wait for you. They're going to let you know that they're unhappy if you, you know, sleep in an hour or two. But God says we need to have this pattern of work and rest. We need this pattern. Not only us, but the people who work for us, the animals that work for us, need this pattern of work and rest. You say, well, why is that? Do we, I mean, we can keep going. I mean, we've seen people who can work seven days a week, you know, 20 hours a day. I, growing up, I knew a lady, she was a lawyer. I'm Bless her, she slept from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. every day, and that was it. She was working the other 22 hours of the day. She was reading, she was, and she could do that. She, but, I mean, she was just one of these people, always had to be moving, always had to be doing something. She slept only two hours a day. That's very unusual. And it's not the pattern that God sets up. He wants us to understand the importance of rest. Because that is part of God's creational design. Even in the depth of our sin, God has promised his people who die in him rest from their trials. God's ultimate goal when we read it in the end of the book of Revelation is to bring rest to his people. The Sabbath rest that we celebrate when we come together and meet like we do this morning. And we sit and we sing praise to God and we we hear the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. It's all pointing to that future rest that we are looking and longing for because of the brokenness of the world that we live in. When we feel that brokenness, we should long for that rest. That's what our hearts are groaning for. And that's what God gives us a taste of. When we don't stop from the necessary work that we have to do, when we don't observe that pattern of work and rest, we gloss over one of the greatest promises that God has given us, that one day we will enter into his rest. He gives us a taste in this pattern of six days of work and a day of rest, he gives us a taste that we would remember that day. He says, remember the Sabbath day because God made it holy. He made it special. He set it apart for a purpose. And if we neglect that purpose, we neglect one of the great promises that God has given us. Because I haven't met anybody in a long time who says, boy, I really, I don't need a vacation. I don't think I'm going to need one for the next 10 years. I'm good to go. I'm going to plow through. And everybody hugs me. I can't wait till I can get a rest. Usually, folks, you know, when I was working in the business world, you know, people would go on vacation, and the first thing they would come back and say, boy, I need a vacation for my vacation. I'm always looking for rest. Well, God has built it in to the cycle of our week. He says, don't neglect it. 
Celebrate it. Celebrate that rest and know what it's pointing to. Because when we don't celebrate the seventh day, what we end up doing is celebrating the sixth day. We look at the day when God created man as the ultimate of creation. Ultimate just means final, the greatest part. The ultimate part of creation is the Sabbath day, the day of rest. But when we neglect the seventh day and we celebrate just the sixth day, the, the, the celebration of mankind, reveling in human glory, and celebrate the sixth day. You see what happens? You remember several weeks ago uh, when I was preaching about the holiness of God, I told you in, in Hebrew literature, in Hebrew language, you can say something once. If you can say something twice, it's important. But if you say something three times, you elevate it to what we call the superlative degree, and it has real power. It's the way we would say good, better, best. Like the best is the superlative. It's the third degree. You know what happens when we take and we celebrate the sixth day and ignore the seventh? We take that sixth day and we elevate that sixth day to the third degree. And you know what you get? You get six, and six, and six. Six to the third degree. Now even if you haven't read the book of Revelation, you know what 666 represents. We become anti-God. We become anti-Christ when we only look out for the celebration of humanity as its ultimate good. And that's what the devil does, right? You don't need to go to church on Sunday. You don't need to spend time with God on Sunday. You can fulfill and search out your own pleasure on that day. Oh, you're resting. Or you're pursuing your own good. You don't need, you don't need God for that day. You see how the devil can take something good and flip it on its head and make it evil? Humanity was created good, even very good. But if we stop there, if we stop at the sixth day, you're never going to enter into the rest of the seventh day. We never get to that completion. We ignore what God has given us for our good, and we only focus on ourselves rather than on Him. Brothers and sisters, the, Bible, the New Testament especially tells us don't neglect meeting together. Don't neglect the celebration of the Sabbath. It's so important. It's so vital for us to understand that process of work and rest. Work and rest. Work and rest. It's God's gift to us. It's our weekly reminder that we are not the be-all, end-all of creation. It's our way of coming together and saying there is something greater than us that we need to acknowledge and understand. That we are looking forward to something greater than just work, 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 work. That we're looking for something greater than is just our pleasure all the time. Because even the greatest human pleasure pales into comparison.
to the rest that we have in God through Jesus Christ. That rest is divine. It is heavenly. It is supernatural. And it is eternal. You can choose to live for yourself now. And be forsaken by God for all eternity. You can never enter into that seventh day of eternal rest. Just a glimpse of what heaven is like. So this is why we don't actually worship on the seventh day. Right? Because technically in our week, the seventh day would be Saturday. That's the day that. Jews would traditionally celebrate the Sabbath. We celebrate it on the first day. Why do we celebrate it on Sunday? On the first day of the week. Because that's the day that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. It was on the first day of the week. And so the Christians of the New Testament came to celebrate God's new creation. Through Jesus Christ. The new creation. The new light that came into the world. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Happened on the first day. And so we come on Sunday. To celebrate that eternal hope. Because our hope through eternity. Our hope in heaven. Heaven come to earth. Rests solely on what happened on Easter Sunday morning. That is what we celebrate. We look forward to that eternal rest because of the promise of the new creation that we can be in Jesus Christ. That one day our bodies will be resurrected like his resurrected body. And oh, won't that be grand? Can you imagine a body with no aches and pains? No creaky joints, no stiff necks, no aching knees. A body that's immune from COVID viruses and cancers. A body that's not marred by the effects of sin. That's the body, that's the hope that we get to spend eternity not in this run-down shell. But we will have eternal rest from not only our sins but from everything that our sins mar, including our bodies. And our loved ones who have died before us in Christ will have that same glorious body will celebrate for all eternity the beauty of God's rest. Beloved, when we come together like we do this morning, gathered with believers all across the globe, we are celebrating and looking forward to the exact same thing. We're looking forward to that eternal Sabbath day, that eternal rest that God has promised that eternal rest that through the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, God has made sure. It's not a false hope. It's not a fleeting hope. It is a guarantee. Paid in blood. Jesus' blood. And guaranteed by his victory. Thanks be to God, who gives us the gift of rest, holy rest. Amen. In response to God's holy word, let us affirm together what we believe by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth 
and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Are there praises or prayer requests that we can bring before the family this morning? All right. Well, let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning to lift up these and any unspoken requests that may still be on our hearts. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as your children called by you, adopted into your family by the blood of Jesus. Looking forward to the eternal rest that you have promised us. Father, we come before you this morning with both praises for what you have done and requests for things that cause us concern. Father, would you hear the groanings of our hearts this morning? Would you take these concerns and these anxieties, these cares from us and grant us your spirit of rest and assurance to know that nothing is out of your care. That we can rest in the knowledge that you are still at work in providing all that we need in this world. Where things seem out of control, where things seem lost beyond hope. Father, would you give us your peace Would you give us your presence and grace that we may endure whatever may come, knowing that you will one day set all things right, knowing that one day you will remove the stain of sin from this world and make it new. Father, we look forward to that rest. We look forward to that cleansing that you have promised. Give us the strength to remain faithful in you throughout these days. We ask all of this in the name of your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ who taught his disciples and so us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. To stand and sing our closing hymn, Abide With Me.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Amen. God.